Coach Gary to the stream. Hi, Gary. Hey, Jara, how you doing? How are you? I'm doing great. So good to see you. Long time no see. <laughs> Same, same, same. I know it was, uh, I believe it was this summer, the last time we saw each other, but even even yeah. then, it's been a while. It's been a while. Even, uh, even then, it's been a, a, a long, a long, long, long time. But I am glad to have you on the show. Just to give you guys a little bit background, how I know Gary, we both went to Xavier, so X you all the way, and that's how we met. And so, Gary, I just want you to start off by introducing yourself to everyone, and then we're going to dive right in for from there okay yeah that's cool um so yeah um official name is gary bernard mcnichols jr um and in the now coaching world i'm I, I'm, I'm coach mag i'm coach mcnichols i'm a coach boomer i'm just whatever you decide to uh make it easier for you um you know you try to get a little bit of branding as far as you know especially nowadays you know branding is almost everything but when it comes down to you know, whatever, when it, connection with people, connection with kids, you kind of sort of have to be at the behest of whatever they decide to to, to give you as far as a label, a type of, title, or anything. But <laughs> um, 28, uh, father of two, um, a re recently married, about a year going on two. Um, I, I went to Xavier, me and Jairo, we met at Xavier, um, class, uh, classmates for a time. Um, I studied a bunch of different things at Xavier, um, <laughs> mass communications for a little bit, um, music for a while, and then um, I settled on math. And then in math is when I found um, my niche in the education world. Um, I worked in a lot of different industries, hospitality, customer service, um, data science, um, research, development, um, marketing, sales, all different type of things. Um, yeah. But I fell into I fell into coaching through the classroom and um, it's been a very, very tedious but inspirational <laughs> journey so far. Yeah. Right. It's your story's so amazing. And I want to make sure that they understand, like you were just telling us. You did marketing and sales, you know, education, data science, all of these things, but now you're currently doing coaching. And what's so incredible about your story you were sharing with me is that you hadn't played football since you were 12 years old and you didn't play in high school and you didn't play in college, but now you're the assistant head coach and you're already interviewing for other <laughs> positions as head coach. So my question to you, and I'm sure viewers also watching and wondering is how did, how did you, what was that journey like for you? How did you go from not having, you know, really, I guess the normal traditional experience, right. In this area to, assistant and now head coach and you even told me you want to start your own organization so tell us a little bit more about that well um my 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 journey in general is um is all about self-discovery um, mm -hmm. um it, it usually people recognize things in you before you recognize them in yourself and that's mm -hmm. our biggest struggle as people growing up right. um having various talents gifts and things like that and then whenever there's detours or anything, usually somebody else sees the detour coming before you do. Absolutely. Somebody usually sees which way you should go off the detour before you do. And then any faculties or any sort of assets that you gain or lose during that situation, people usually notice it before you do. Yeah. And um, that's always been my story. I've always been that kid who had a lot of different talents. It was like the jack of all trades, you know, but never really could narrow down what exactly um is my purpose what exactly am i supposed to do um when we met at xavier um i was still in the midst of um a 15-year battle of not necessarily knowing what i was going to do with my life not necessarily knowing um who i was going to be what profession i was going to have how i was going to make ends meet for the long term but one thing i always knew is that i wanted things that that were kind of grand um mm. i've always wanted things that were on a higher level simply because um, I came from generational poverty um, in different facets of where I grew up and stuff like that. So for me, it was all about, it's always been about dreaming. It's always been about goal setting. Um, even in times where I wasn't work ethic wise, the, the strongest person, um, I was always striving towards some grander goal that was larger than myself. Um, and with my story, it's pretty much the same. Um, when you get told no so many times mm -hmm. at a age, 
for just various things that you feel like all kids should be able to do or right. um, all, all, all people in general should have be able to strive for when you're young is when you're supposed to dream and you're supposed to work right. towards those. And then when you get told that none of the dreams that you want are for you either at that moment or in general, um, you as a kid, you often don't know how to put that into words, put that into context. And so I spent a long time, including a lot of my college time, like just trying to figure out what I was going to do. Mm. Um, what the heck am I doing on this earth? Like these steps I'm taking every day, where they lead me. Um, mm. It wasn't until I stopped chasing particular goals and particular achievements and particular benchmarks. And then I started chasing the qualities and faculties that come along with those experiences, like mm. fat, trustworthiness, um, humble, humility, um, arrogance, even confidence, those type of things that come along with these situations. It wasn't until I started chasing those that everything that I ever wanted kind of started chasing me instead of me chasing it. And, right. and that's really my biggest message is don't chase the things that you want, chase the things that come with them and then mm. let the things that you want chase you. Mm, I, I love that. That's so powerful. And so now that you have this kind of, like you said, you you were going through self-discovery and you kind of have this better perspective and you know the direction in which your life is going. If you could go back to your 12 year old self, your, your younger self in those moments where you, like you said, you don't know how to put stuff in words. You, you kind of just feel flustered and conflicted as to what you want to do. Like, what would you tell your younger self back then? One, I would tell him, I would tell him to sit down for a second and just think, you know, don't think about um, what you've been told. Don't think about how that affects your current life. Don't think about all the work that you've put in up until this point being denied or whatever. Right. Don't think about that. I would tell him to sit down, write your thoughts out, you know, however long that takes. If that takes a week, if that takes a month, if that takes a year, right. you have plenty of time. You're 12 years old. Right. Um, you're, 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 you're in a place that's very desolate. There's not a whole lot for you to do. So you have nothing but time and just sit there and just write out your thoughts, you know, come up with a new plan. Um, and in that new plan, don't forget about the old plan. The old plan was in your brain for a reason, right? We right. like the things that we like. We're exposed to the things that we're exposed to. We're gifted with the things that we're gifted with for a reason. And we're going to use every last one of them. Right. So for me, it's just all of these gifts that you have, you're going to be able to use them one day and you won't be able to use them all until you decide for yourself um that okay this thing that i've been able to do is the thing that i need to do and so right. for me um it was not letting go of football like even at 12 mm -hmm. i to this day i've never spent a day without i never spent a 24-hour period without some sort of form of football whether it was entertainment whether it was um, studying film, whether it was talking about it, whether it was um, news or media or anything, just and and what I would tell myself lastly is don't lose that because you mm. will have a, you will have an opportunity to recall all of this history, all of this, all of these schematics, all of these different things, all these different documentaries, books, and things that you've read on all of these great coaches, great players and all of that, you will have a chance to use all of that information. So just keep going with that goal in mind because that goal, while it may be fit with a detour, that's not particularly for you. Um, okay. The path that you're going to serve with it, the path that you're going to travel with it will be one that, that's worth it. Right. That's again, that's so powerful. That's so powerful and incredible. And I think it's important for people, like you said, to just stop and, and think even in our adult lives. Sometimes we think we have everything figured out. And, you know, I think a lot of times when uh, we're told, I'll say our generation told you go to you were supposed to go to school, go to college, right, graduate and immediately start your career. And, you know, I've talked to friends um, and they're just feeling like, OK, that's really not the reality. You sometimes start something and you get somewhere and you feel like that's not what you want to do. But you're also feeling so like just overwhelmed because, like you said earlier, you know, you have all of these incredible gifts and talents, but it's just, you know, putting it all together and trying to map out like which direction your life is going to go and you know what suits you best but sometimes we don't give us 
give ourselves enough time to kind of just pace through things and just think and not put all of that pressure. So my next question for you is, what is it specifically about football that captures you, that just kind of draws you in? I know you said even in film and other avenues, you know, football was always there, but why has it been always there? Why is football so important to you? That's number one, my first question. And then my second question is for people who would say, you know, football, it's just a game. You know, some people think it's silly that, you know, people are so into football as it is. What would you say to those people? That's my second question. Well, my first question is for, the first question as far as like why, why football in particular? Why is that the, the content that drives me so much? Um, I, one, as far as upbringing is concerned, I grew up in a family that was completely comprised of generations on generations of those athletes. So, um, and particularly in the quarterback position, um, I, I grew up, my uncles and my dad, um, they all played you know, in various positions at various um, spots. And then also in that same um, community that I grew up in. So I kind of, I grew up in it. Um, um, I grew up uh, in particular as far as household with that expectation, with that sort of goal in mind, with the different stories that you hear about, you know, different um, relatives being legends in various uh, aspects as far as sports were concerned. And mostly our conversation was about football on both sides. On my mom's side and my dad's side, it was mostly football. They played other sports, but football was mainly the one. And so growing up in that, being the younger of the of that generation that I was a part of with the older cousins and stuff, watching them go through and mm -hmm. different aspects and have success and stuff like that. Um, th also the connection with my father in particular, we don't have the strongest as far as, you know, every facet of life, but as far mm -hmm. as um, one of the main things that keep us um, tight knit over all of these years, one of the main things of our relationship has been being able to talk, talk about the X's and O's, talk about the personnel, talk about mm -hmm. the different schemes, and stuff like that. Um, I was, six and seven years old sitting Saturday mornings after after we played football and, and me and him sitting there and we're going through different scenarios that I played in in the game. And then while we're watching, you know, games on TV and then Sunday after church will be the same thing. So a lot of our best conversations were centered around football. Some of our worst conversations were centered <laughs> around football. So, and then um, I would say lastly, just um, I have this incessant, this incessant need to uh, to prove to prove myself in a lot of different ways. So to myself, obviously to be the best I can be, um, to other people who are ingratiated in whatever industry. So if I'm a teacher, then I want the other teachers around me to think I'm a good teacher. Um, and then as far as um, the world at large, um, I think that I'm fit to, uh, and my story has led me to being able to have impact um, in a lot of different ways mm. uh, on a larger scale. And what I found that, the, that that sports in general has a larger reach as far as youth youth are concerned, mm -hmm. um, right there with um, classroom educational content. So I feel yeah. that this industry with my face and my name and, and the journey that I had, I feel that the best way for me to impact as many people as possible is to impact the generations underneath me right. um, in their way that give me that gives me um, platform to go ahead and impact people that are same age as me or older. Right. Um, football and education are a huge, huge way, especially in 2021, to be able to do that. And I'm, I'm taking the opportunity and grabbing it by the horns. Um, I come from teachers just like I come from football players and coaches. So um, I think on both sides, uh, education is a key part to why I'm doing what I'm doing. I, I I love that. And so for my second question, for people who just say, you know, football's just more than a game, you know, I mean, it's just a game, but there are many people who feel like it's more than a game. You were just saying, what would you, what would you say to those people? I can speak to um, examples such as Miss Jennifer, Coach Jennifer King, um, who um, is inspiring through her employment in the NFL that young girls can, can really be anywhere in any industry that they can that they want to be i can speak right. to uh jim brown in the 60s and how he basically waged war against whole organizations in areas that were you know um racially divided and things like that and putting careers on the line in order to inspire change through that i can i can think about um I can think about various situations like um, Deion Sanders in the 90s showing that, you know, being the only player that played in the World Series as well as, 
as playing in a Super Bowl, um, showing people that not only can you be great at one thing, but you can also be great at a couple of things if you just right. put your mind to it. So I think that there's a lot of, um, and then I could think of um, a, a inspirational stories such as um, Alex Smith of the Washington football team who dealt with a gruesome leg in, uh, injury, came within inches of his life uh, numerous times and how that story of perseverance brought him back to being able to start games in the playoffs this past year. So um, I, football, it, it may just be a game, but just like any other game or any other practice, um, it represents life in a lot of different ways. And if the only way you're not going to see it is if you don't, you're not involved with it or you're, it's just something you're not looking for. I, I, I agree. And those were some really great examples because all of everybody who listens to those stories, they can always find some kind of, you know, inspiration from those. So for you as as a coach, what's your favorite part about coaching and what would you say is the most important aspect of coaching? Because everybody, as we know, coaches differently. There's, you know, plenty of coaches all across the world, but everybody has their own kind of co coaching philosophy and, and style and everyone views it differently. So for you, Coach Gary, what does coaching mean to you? And and again, like I said, what's the most important aspect of coaching for you? Um, coaching is teaching. Um, any successful coach on any level will tell you um, if they don't involve teaching, and um, in evolution through classroom work or classroom tactics in order to achieve their goal on a football field and they're not really doing it in the, um, to the fullest extent that they should be. Um, you are a classroom teacher. Mm. Um, you, that's what you do. Your content is football. That's mm. what it boils down to. So if you don't treat it like that, if you don't lesson plan, if you don't schedule post, if you don't um, incorporate the particular learning styles that go in to your core classes as well as the football, you, then you're not doing it right. And I think for me, that's the part about it that I excel at. Since I'm pretty decent as a classroom teacher and can have a lot of impact as a classroom teacher, um, I try to bring those practices to the football field, to practices and things like that. So the biggest moment for me um, is when a student has that aha moment. When you see that light bulb come on, um, that happens often. Um, in, in classrooms on a daily basis where the kid you scaffold or you remediate back to a particular time or a particular mm -hmm. dictionary term that they that they couldn't remember at the time. And then you give them one little indicator and then they say, oh, that's that. Well, that happens in the classroom as far as football is concerned. And it happens on the field during drill work, indie time, um, pass scale, first team, second team, um, special teams, defense. It doesn't matter. Like you're going to have a moment where maybe a kid wasn't getting it. The learning curve was a little steep. Right. And then they get to the top of that learning curve and you see them go downhill with all the information that they have in a great way. And for me, mm. that's like the biggest moment, just like in a classroom. That's the biggest moment because I get excited when you learn. When you when, right. when you show me that you've learned something, I get excited, whether I'm in a classroom or I'm on the football okay. field. So I think that's it for me. Right. I love that. Now we know, although coaching is rewarding and there's many benefits, I know there's also challenges that come with coaching as well. And so can you share with us a little bit of maybe about some of the challenges that you've faced or experienced yourself? Um, well, being young, being young, as far as experience, you have to kind of pull from your different experiences in the industry because this is a, a start in the mailroom type business. Um, this is a um, file some papers type business, um, do your work, do all the ancillary things, as a, especially as a younger coach or whether it be youth as far as experience or age. Um, when you come into a new a staff or you come into a new situation, you're obviously um, you want to have that you have that push and pull of, well, I'm good enough to do this. I'm talented enough to do this. However, I don't have enough experience for or cachet for um, the staff to ingratiate me. Yeah. Now, the one thing that I'll say is. I've had more experience um, with the quarterback position and with football than I than than normal people who haven't been in the industry or have been away from the industry. And then I study it in a particular way um, very efficiently that allows me to display that information without ruffling a lot of feathers. And it has it has lended itself to, you know, me getting a little bit further along trajectory rise than a lot of guys in my position. However, um, the biggest thing that I can say is that when you don't have a situation in which you feel ultimately supported, and this is for assistant coaches, this is for volunteer coaches, this is for um, the head coach, 
um, if you don't have systems in place that support you, whether it be administration or whether it be faculty or whether it be the players or whether it be your staff, if you don't have um, support in all those aspects working in the same direction with the same goals in mind, you're gonna face a lot of different type of difficulties, mm -hmm. um, whether it be with budgeting, whether it be with um, different policies that can be maneuvered, bent, but not broken, um, different type of things. Whereas you can see other situations to where those administration, those faculty, those, that, that, that entire holistic experience is brought into what you do. Right. And you, you can often see the difference between um, those two scenarios. Some, especially in high school football, if there's no investment in the kids from the community, you're gonna suffer. And then if there is, then you're gonna see the, the fruits of that labor pretty quickly. I, I, I love that. I think that's I think that's such a great point, like you said at the end, about the community also needs to get behind it. Cause I can't tell you how many stories that I've heard where it almost seems like, you know, if it wasn't really for some of, you know, because not all people can depend on, you know, their parents to support them and, and their goals, right? But if it wasn't for their coaches, a lot of kids would say, I wouldn't be, you know, where I am today because of, you know, simply because they didn't have anybody else or they didn't have the community behind them or they didn't even have their own parents. So I think that's really big and that's such a key. As you know, you know, you're coaching during the pandemic which I could ima imagine brings challenges within itself. Um, so tell me a little bit more about some of the things you guys had to do. Did you have to resort to, I don't know, even virtual practices? Were, did you know some of your, your, your boys, were they affected by that? You know, missing out on that one-on-one -on -one coaching that you were able to get them? What did you have to do during the pandemic and how did you guys you know, manage through that and adjust? Well, I'll tell you this, um, the pandemic did hit us in particular pretty hard this year um, in regards to our numbers. Um, we're a small school um, in New Orleans um, classified as 2A, um, which in a major city like this is very, really hard to find small schools in a, um, that aren't private. Um, we play a pretty much private schedule because of that. Um, we, we had a lot. We had pretty much all away games last year except for homecoming. Um, and we, we couldn't field a lot of guys. There were weeks where we didn't have, we unfortunately had to forfeit because we didn't have 11. We didn't have a full 11. So wow. um, it, it presented itself in a lot of different ways, but we just had to be creative as far as um, how we set our practice schedule. If there were days where only six guys showed up and we, right. amongst the coaching staff, we had to figure out how to, you know, muscle up that other five. Um, or, you know, do like half schedule where you wouldn't have the full O lineman set, you would have half the line and then you would flip over to the other side and work the other ways and different things like that. And then there were even weeks where we had really big games coming up and we didn't have enough players for the scout team. And so here I am strapping on a helmet and a jersey to, to oh, play man. scout team for different situations. I mean, thank God I'm still in shape. Thank God for being young. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you think about it is, is the one thing that the kids can't see, right? The one thing that the kids can't see is that you're struggling because you're showing them, and this is, I guess, to speak to the role model situation on, you're showing them how to deal with adversity. You're showing them that every second of every day, there's gonna be times where all you're gonna hear is no, right? And as a kid and as a, and as a man who at times when I was a kid heard no and was ultimately affected by it, um, I had to understand and, recognize the moment that I was in, this is a chance for me to show this kid that no is not the answer, right? It may be an answer, but it's a temporary one and you can make it yes, however you want. Um, and so through that, we just had to show our ingenuity, our creativity. Um, and we had some some successful things, um, some, we left some breadcrumbs last season that are starting to lead us to a path this season that I think will be fruitful for us. So um, we are historically not a successful program um, especially post Katrina, um, so there are obviously some mindset things that we're, we're we're working around on some culture things that we're trying to figure out. But I definitely think that we're on the cusp of something good here, simply because of um, the coaches we have here and the adversity that they've all faced in their respective lives and what we're what we're how we're using it to fuel our journey. Right. No, I think that's amazing. So from you and just your story. What is the biggest thing that you want people to take away? What do you really feel like? You said so many great, powerful points, but if you had to narrow it down to just one thing that you want people to learn from your story or take away, what would that be? 
Um, it's kind of a 1A, 1B. 1A would be pay attention to detail because you'll only be able to do this once. Mm. You know, we face a lot of different tests. We face a lot of different tests. And some of those tests may be because of the same reasons. Um, they may be because you need the same asset or facet added or taken away from your life or skill improved or whatever. But every one of those situations in itself are different. So if you don't pay attention to that test the first time, you're, you're not going to get that test again because it's going to look different the next time. Um, I, as a person who gives tests weekly, um, I may give you the same test four times in a month, but I may even reword, reword the questions or reorder the questions, right? right? So even that test looks different to you. Um, and second, my 1B would be um, never stop holding up your end of the bargain. Um, even as little kids, we we make deals, right? Whether we know it or not, we make deals with the universe. We make deals with the higher power. We make deals with ourselves. You're right. And the second you stop holding up your end of that deal, you don't deserve whatever comes with that end, right? So if you can't be in negotiations with yourself and you're not doing what you can to make sure that you make the best business decision for mm -hmm. yourself, and that comes along with being with other people as well, you can't... Um, leave things up to chance for someone else because then they are in control of what you do. And when we don't hold up our end of the bargain, we are leaving it up to chance for some other one, so for somebody else to be in control. You're right. Absolutely. I agree with that a hundred percent. And I, I, I love what you said about pay attention to the details. Cause I think, you know, we kind of have this concept of maybe not the first time, not the second time, but the third time, you know how they say third time's the charm. But the reality is you brought up a very good point. That one time might have been your chance. We don't always get second and third chances. And I think it's kind of like this, this maybe fantasy or fairy tale that we kind of live in or a story that we like to tell ourselves. We'll get these second, third, fourth, fifth chances. But sometimes if you would have paid attention to the details, like you said, the first time you could have <laughs> been on a been on a good path. But so what's next for you, Gary? What's next for you? Where do you see yourself in five, 10 years from now? And I know you said you wanted to start an organization in Morgan City. Um, let's end it on, on that note. Tell us a little bit about where your journey goes from here, because we'd love to keep up with you and all of the things, amazing things that are to come for you. Well, just like just like everything in my life, um, the theme is that, you know, it's coming out of adversity. Um, I've had some um, adverse situations, um, even in this calendar year um, mm -hmm. with um, different situations as far as um, various staffs that um, I've come in contact with um, as far as I've been a part of or that I've had earshot of. Right. Um, and then um, in particular with this organization, um, I've been involved with a lot of training businesses over the past uh, two years, two, three years, um, and been ingratiated with some of the guys and been able to talk to them about business models and things like that. And so I think over the course of the next year, I'm, I'm ready to get into a relatively untapped area and um, mm -hmm. help some underserved kids who are just kind of like me have the gifts, have the talents, but just don't have the resources. Um, and with that, um, I've, I've gotten some backing of some corporate people. So I don't want to speak on it a little uh, too much, but it is a situation that will help um, South Louisiana, Southeast Louisiana, North Louisiana, um, different parts of Mississippi um, and Texas um, and moving forward. And then hopefully throughout the entire South region, um, just based on kids, kids like myself, um, kids who grew up in the areas that I grew up in that, um, are trying to make changes, but they don't see a lot of change in front of them. They that they're they're trying to be the change themselves. Right. Um, and so, in the next five years, I'm hoping to grow that. Also, um, planning to you know, there's different minority fellowships and things for the NFL. Um, just ways to grow my platform and be around different people who um, I can network it network network with and learn things from and grow with. Um, and so the next five years, you know, I plan to do do at least one off season or OTA or mini camp or preseason situation with an NFL team. And because um, of the particular position I coach and the particular side of the ball I'm on, there's a lot of incentive that will help, you know, someone like myself be able to, you know, reverse some generational things that 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 mm -hmm. has plagued my family over years and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. As my, as as I grow, as I as I am lifted, I want to lift others um, to give others. Um, a platform to be able to do the same, you know, and we want to make those type of things generational. We want to make those type of uh, concepts and situations more feasible and invisible as far as um, our communities are concerned. 
Right. I, I love that. And I think as, as long as you continue to have the mindset that you do and keep doing what you're doing, I know you're going to be extremely successful as you are already. And like I said, your story is so inspirational and so powerful, especially I would say in these times, because, you know, we're taught that, you know, a lot of the things millennials say and struggle with are they want to get a job, but you're required to have all of this experience, right? And it's just like, okay, well, if you don't give me an opportunity, then I'll never get the experience. But you defied all odds because even though you didn't have that spirit, um, excuse me, experience, you proved yourself and people saw that in you by the way you carry yourself, by the your goals, your mindset, and you got to where you want to be. So again, like I keep saying, there's so many great things, incredible things that people can learn from you and your story. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. And we will keep up with you and all your adventures and the amazing things that you're doing. So thank you so much, Gary. No, I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jira Nicole. Um, yeah. always looking to, you know, help you out, help us out, obviously, because of our connection. Right. Um, but just because of how powerful this platform is and, and will continue to be for, you know, people like us, people that are watching. Um, the one thing I will say is, you know, for anybody like me or like or like yourself that are watching this and don't really know how to get started in that industry that they may not have went and got a degree in or maybe didn't you know, didn't take that internship last year. So now I'm really kind of, I don't have any work portfolio to show anyone. Learn as much as you can about the profession you want. Right. Um, become as planned and detail oriented as possible. And I guarantee you the talent that you have for that industry will shine itself through that organization. Yes, that perfect. You said it perfect, beautiful. Yes, I agree. Well, thank you so much, Gary. And I look forward to talking with you a little bit more down the line and having you back on the